home for a big series like Frontline so that there's an open, fair, really probing look at the world, the serious issues that we're all facing, the questions that we have beyond just the momentary news that's breaking because PBS is really clear-eyed about the importance of investigative journalism. Americans need PBS more than ever. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. Do you know your dad is the baddest man in the world? Without any further introduction, Muhammad Ali. He's young, he's handsome. They know it. Never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. I'm showing the world that you can stay yourself and get respect from the world. He's 22 years old. Ah! And he's standing up to the whole establishment. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. Tune in or stream Muhammad Ali September 19th on NEPM. Coming up, stories we're connecting you with tonight. We pay a visit to a beloved Berkshire's garden that's been called a museum of living things. We're really a collection of plants, so people look at how many species there are and how many different types of plants we feature. Read or else, it's the battle cry of a local author who champions literacy. My books have been adapted to plays and musicals. That's not happening in the Bronx, but that magic can happen here because it's a magical place. And did you get a chance to see the sunrise? No worries if you didn't. We've got you covered. His cameras are set and his drone is ready. I mean, this kind of light lasts, if you're lucky, 15 minutes. We'll bring you those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Established in 1934, the Berkshire Botanical Garden is revered as one of the older public display gardens in the Northeast. With over 3,000 species and varieties in its collection, it's referred to as a museum of living things and is a showcase of horticulture and garden design. It encompasses 24 acres of land at the intersection of routes 102 and 183 in beautiful and historic Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And producer Dave Frazier visited the garden and spoke with its executive director to find out what makes it so special for so many. We look at ourselves as a museum of living things, so we're not a park, we're not just a pleasure garden that you walk through and see beautiful things, but we're really a collection of plants, so people look at uh, how many species there are and how many d different types of plants uh, we feature, and botanical gardens uh, sort of work together uh, throughout the country, throughout the region, uh, in uh, communicating with one another and exchanging plants sometimes and exchanging science behind plants as well. Founded in 1934, uh, and it was actually a collection of local garden clubs and civic uh, organizations that got together and said, oh, the, the Berkshires should really have a botanical garden. And so by 1935, there was an initial gift of land here that people started cultivating. The war years came shortly thereafter and really put us a little bit more on the map because uh, the botanical garden started focusing on uh, self-sufficiency because that was such a big theme during the war years and we became quite well known for teaching people about growing your own fruits and vegetables. We had trial orchards on site, we had trial arbors where grapes were growing and vegetable plots and so what became known as victory gardens, that whole concept of growing your own produce and being self-sufficient was very much something that the botanical garden uh, was teaching the local population. <laughs> We are located in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, so in the heart of the Berkshires. We are about 24 acres of gardens and wild areas. Our main season is from May 1 through Columbus Day weekend, and that really coincides with the growing season, so there's not much really growing in the off-season, but we're very much open year-round. We have classes year-round, so people come visit us even in the midst of winter, and the gardens themselves are actually quite beautiful in the middle of winter as well, so we have a lot of four-season interest. If you look around, there are a lot of um, evergreen trees and shrubs, so they will just provide that structure in the middle of winter, and then you have this beautiful Berkshire snow scene uh, developing, so it's, it's almost as beautiful as it is in the middle of the season right now. 
It's a really great collection of different scaled garden rooms, I would say. And people really appreciate the fact that we're not huge. We're not a, a huge New York Botanical Garden or a Tower Hill. So the scale is manageable. And you come here as a garden lover or a gardener yourself, and you can find things that fit the scale of a home garden. In a normal year, and we're heading into that normalcy again, uh, you really go from town to town here in the Berkshires, and you can really spend you know, days and days just touring the county. And uh, it's certainly what attracted me to this area initially and originally. And when I speak to newcomers to the area, and we've had quite a few uh, as, a, as the result of COVID as well, um, you will hear that a lot. It's, it's sort of what, uh, what attracts people's attention. Even coming from a, a you know, big metropolis like New York or Boston, people are quite taken by the, the quality and the quantity of what we offer here. Every Friday night, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, but it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. And don't forget, you can always interact with us via our social channels. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CP on NEPM. Connecting Point is your home on the web for exploring the best in creativity, culture, and community in Western New England. Grab your laptop, tablet, or mobile device and connect with us right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. The Berkshire County City of Pittsfield is host to a dazzling array of creatives, including artists, entrepreneurs, and interesting people of all stripes. One such person is acclaimed children's author, literacy advocate, and motivational speaker, Ty Allen Jackson. Through his books like The Super Duper Kid and The Read or Else Movement that he co-founded, Jackson has long championed reading for both children and adults alike. A native of the Bronx, Ty sat down with me to discuss his work, his passion for reading, and why he chooses to call Pittsfield home. Well, it all started from a question from my, at the time, eight-year-old son. He said, Dad, can we open up a lemonade stand? And, and we did, right on the corner of our home in uh, Dexter and Elm Street. And he made $50 in three hours selling lemonade, which, you know, totally blew my mind. And he said, Dad, what am I going to do with all this money? And I really didn't know. So I went to the bookstore to see if I could find a book to teach my son about finance and entrepreneurship, because he was, after all, now an entrepreneur. And, you know, I noticed initially two things. One, there were so few books featuring children of color in a positive, contemporary way. And there were so few books teaching financial literacy. And so the, those two things combined into Danny Dollar. And, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Danny Dollar is clearly an extension of your son. And the character was born from his experience. How important is representation in books for children of color? It's incredibly vital that children see themselves depicted, especially in positive and contemporary ways. There are plenty of books with underground railroads and segregation and things of that nature. But it's also incredibly important for white children to be able to see that exact same figure in children of color. So it, it, it really makes uh, a tremendous difference in the eyes of all children, but specifically children of color, because it gives them a level of pride that I don't think exists in any other form. Now, Danny Dollar came about from the very real need for you to educate your son on finance and the importance of that. What other kinds of stories do you like to tell and what themes really resonate with you? I want the children who read these books just to feel like they see themselves depicted in them, regardless of race or gender or anything else. That's why my stories are very broad. That's why they're always fun. One of uh, Two of my books are about superheroes. And, and think about what superheroes stand for. They stand for nobility and courage and honor and strength and wisdom and, and, and taking care of your community. And those are all attributes we all want to have and certainly that we all want to see within our children. So it's really important you know, for that not to be compartmentalized to just one specific group, well, just a little black boy, it should be for all children. So it's really important not to stereotype my characters. They're just, you know, amazing children who happen to be black. Just as you mentioned, you said that comic books have been very inspiring for you, and it's often one of the first mediums that children explore when they begin reading. What is it about comic books that really speaks to you, and what attributes do you really enjoy about those books? Yeah, I think it's one, it's a sense of adventure. It's, it's a sense of, of, of seeing 
what you would like for yourself to be. You know, when you see a Batman or a Superman who's, who's courageous and strong and smart and, you know, just really wants to help their fellow person. I mean, like, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to be a part of, of making the world a better place? So, you know, that's one of the aspects of, of superheroes. I think the other part is that, you know, most superheroes are all kind of flawed. And I think there's, there's, there's genius in being able to see these really strong-willed people who want to save the world, but they're also kind of just like us, you know? They, they, you know, they brush their teeth and, you know, they ha have issues and problems the same way that we have. It, it makes a, um, it makes a, a bond and a, and a conduit from reader to, to, to character to be able to see themselves depicted. So being attracted to those flawed characters in the comic books, do you try to put those characteristics in your own books with your characters? Oh, 100%. And it's, it's not just being flawed, it's just kind of normalized. I want them to be able to see those same type of basic, normal, flawed characteristics that we all have and possess and how we overcome them and you know how we can maybe even use them as assets to make the world a better place. So for, for kids to be able to make that connection and say, wow, this particular character is just like me and not just the ways that look like me, but in the ways that make me me. How did the read or else movement come about and why use such a serious and dramatic statement? Because it is serious and dramatic. The importance and power of, of literacy is, I think, in my opinion, one of the unspoken most but most important aspects of our life and culture. They dramatically impact almost everything that ails our country, from poverty and mass incarceration to teen pregnancy, poor health, unemployment, you name it, it's directly, not indirectly, but directly connected to illiteracy. Two out of three children who cannot read proficiently by the fourth grade will end up incarcerated or on welfare. And that was just a game changer to us. Like when we see that basically if our kids can't read proficiently by the fourth grade, the majority of them are going to end up incarcerated. So, um, so just, uh, just that premise alone created the whole read or else movement. And it's, it's really just been phenomenal how the world has kind of in, embraced that, that really simple but yet powerful statement. Now, literacy is more than just a vocation for you, as you were just speaking about the incarcerated individuals. It's a passion of yours. What fuels that passion for you? I, I think it's maybe no different than the whole superhero aspect of wanting to make the world a better place. You know, leaving this place, you know, when my time comes a little better than when I was here. Like, what, what better way to do that than impact and empower our, our most beautiful and important assets, our children? So being a child for anyone can be really, really difficult, confusing, and hard. How do books help navigate the childhood? Books just bring a level of, of, of unbridled passion and imagination that you can't capture anywhere else. Um, Stephen King called books portable pieces of magic, and, and I feel like that's exactly what they are, and, and that magic transfers from book to reader with, with every page, and I, I think it's, it's, it's the foundation of, of, of making your soul even more magical than it already is. If you're up early enough to catch the sunrise and the conditions are right, you may be treated to a showcase of amazing colors in the sky. Local photographer Jamie Malcolm Brown captures scenes like this across New England, earning himself a reputation as one of the best landscape photographers in the region. Connecting Point's Ross Lipman met Malcolm Brown on an early morning where the sunrise and Malcolm Brown's photos didn't disappoint. In the early morning hours when most of us are still asleep, Jamie Malcolm Brown is awake. Uh, getting pretty close. And waiting. Yeah. Nice. For signs in the sky. Oh yeah, we're getting some real nice color through the trees too. Malcolm Brown is a landscape and aerial photographer. Here at Cranberry Pond in Montague, his cameras are set and his drone is ready. I mean, this kind of light lasts, if you're lucky, 15 minutes. Soon, these faint hints of pinks, reds, and purples will burst with color. And that's when Malcolm Brown takes flight. Oh yeah, this is a nice guy. <laughs> we lucked out. Capturing a sunrise like this, with so much color and brilliance, is what Malcolm Brown describes as an inexact science. As much time as I spend 
looking at the weather maps, I get dud after dud because all it takes is one low cloud on the horizon to kill everything. Though this is certainly not one of those days. It's the kind where a picture is worth at least a thousand words. I mean, I always loved like the idea of photography. Like growing up, my family had like the old big giant VHS camera that you had on your shoulder, and I was always using that at family parties and stuff. His childhood passion has grown into Malcolm Brown being one of the most well-known photographers in New England, based here in Western Massachusetts, living in Shutesbury. On social media, his work is shared by thousands of followers. The tagline for his posts, a reflection of his philosophy. Get out and explore however you can. I mean, primarily it's the love of being outside. Like, I just, I love to be out exploring new places. I like that, that drama of things that people don't normally see because they're asleep. From sunrises and sunsets to capturing the Milky Way in the night sky, Malcolm Brown uses his passion for photography to fuel those days he gets little sleep. On Mondays, I'm working full time, homeschooling, and trying to manage my social media presence, which is how like photographers these days get their work out. And it's, it's some days I just can't do it. And it's difficult, but it's the next morning that excites me. The next morning that I can get out for a couple hours and hopefully capture something beautiful. He's also exploring new ways to capture that beauty. At Gunbrook Falls, just down the road in Sunderland, Malcolm Brown is testing out his new slider. It's a device that he'll program to move his camera little by little, capturing one frame at a time. It's hundreds in total that, when put together, gives you a unique perspective. Landscape photography is really just the act of being out in the landscape and capturing an image, but I use new tools for that. So like the drone gives you a new perspective that you can't get otherwise. And then the slider that I'm using, it, it can show movement and time in a way that the, the human eye can't see. Malcolm Brown's goal is for photography to become his full-time job in the next five years, though he doesn't think it'll happen simply by selling his work. Instead, it'll be through sharing his knowledge with other photographers. I think making this a living is going to depend on me finding a way to teach other photographers how to do things. So doing more workshops, um, writing ebooks, and doing tutorials. Like that's, that's the way I think that most landscape photographers are making money. Until then, he's at a point where he makes enough money through photography to keep buying new equipment and pay for his travel. Though there's still no putting a price on some of the experiences he's had, including here in Western Mass. One morning, it was like super foggy. The sun came up through the fog, and one tree in somebody's yard just looked amazing. Like the sun was glowing behind it. I had on my long lens. Just jumped out of the car, took some snaps, and it's just, it doesn't look like you're in Massachusetts. Like, it, that moment was just extraordinary. Western Massachusetts boasts a long history of hosting acclaimed poets, and writers from Emily Dickinson to Ocean Vuong have called the area home. One such poet is former Boston tenant lawyer turned renowned poet Martin Espada. A resident of the area and a professor at UMass Amherst, Espada has published more than 20 books as a poet, editor, essayist, and translator. His most recent collection is entitled Floaters and includes poems that touch on personal accounts and songs of love, as well as tackling the difficult issues of race and protest. I spoke with Espada to learn more about his work and the book. I had for a long time lived this double life as poet-lawyer. Poet always came first, by the way. 
And I noticed that there was a position open uh, in the English department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I began teaching at UMass Amherst in uh, the fall of 1993, and I have been there ever since. Now, does uh, my life as a legal services lawyer influence my work as a poet? Absolutely. Um, the common denominator is advocacy. Advocacy, speaking on behalf of others who do not have the opportunity to speak for themselves. Uh, I did that as a lawyer in Chelsea District Court with my clients who, who came from uh, Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic or Salvador or Guatemala. And I do it as uh, a poet. And I'm doing it with this new book called Floaters. You have published more than 20 books as a poet, editor, essayist, translator, and just as you mentioned, your current publication is titled Floaters. What is the meaning behind the title? The, uh, the title comes from a term used by certain members of the Border Patrol to describe those who drown crossing over the border. Um, in particular, the title poem deals with um, a, a Salvadoran father and daughter migrants who came to be known as Oscar and Valeria. They drowned in June of uh, 2019, crossing uh, the Rio Grande, and uh, a photograph of their bodies went viral. Um, one thing led to another, sparked uh, outrage sparked grief, but it also sparked trutherism. And there was a post, uh, an anonymous post, on the uh, page of the I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group alleging that the photograph was a fake. Trutherism. And so uh, some poems begin as an argument. This poem began as an argument, both with that Facebook post alleging that this photograph was a fake, and as an argument with the slur, the word floaters. Poets, of course, have to be attuned to language, and especially when it is uh, abused in the service of power. Now, in a review of floaters by the North American Review, it says that instead of being overwhelmed by the delusional past of Americanist narratives, you face its ugly truths and require readers to do so too. Do you agree with that assessment? And if so, what are some of these ugly truths that readers will uncover in this book? The ugly truth is that we do not live up to our high ideals. The ugly truth is that uh, millions of people in this country live with uh, racism, not as an abstraction uh, or as a debatable political phenomenon, but as a lived reality uh, in, in concrete terms that diminish them or even destroy them. Um, and so we see this in poem after poem, but it's important to point out too that it's not merely a catalog of victimization um, and that uh, I do whatever I can as a poet to chronicle resistance as well. And I want to also note that you have been very vocal through your poetry, um, responding to many of the policies and controversies of the former um, Trump administration. And one of your poems, poems titled Not For Him, The Fiery Lake of the False Prophet touches on a hate crime that occurred right here in Massachusetts shortly after former President Trump announced his run for office. With a new administration in office and a national reckoning on racial justice, what do you hope to see? I hope to see something better. I hope to see the rhetoric match the reality. Um, obviously, there are many progressive initiatives put forward now by uh, the Biden administration. It's certainly uh, a big step forward from the monstrosity that preceded it, the Trump administration. And yes, Donald Trump, um, even in the speech where he announced his candidacy, uh, called uh, Mexican migrants uh, criminals and rapists. And that was the, in turn, 
the catalyst for the hate crime committed in Boston uh, by two brothers from South Boston against a homeless Mexican immigrant sleeping outside a station on the red line. Um, as far as the present day is concerned, the one area where I think we are still seeing a, a glaring uh, contradiction is in terms of our treatment of migrants at the southern border. Um, there is a continuation of Trump policies rather than a contradiction of Trump policies in certain areas, particularly the failure to, uh, to lift uh, the prohibitions of Title 42, the public health emergency measure, which is effectively shutting down um, migration at the southern border, but especially application for asylum. And asylum, of course, is, uh, is a human right. You describe your collection as reflecting on the present in the light of the past. In doing so, do you see hope for the future or do you take more of a pessimistic outlook on, on looking ahead? Do I see hope for the future? Consider the alternative. I don't think we uh, can give in to despair. I think we have to look in the collective mirror and ask ourselves one fundamental question. Who are we? Who are we as a nation? Who are we as a community? Who are we as individuals? And can we find it in ourselves um, to exercise that empathy, uh, which goes hand in hand with democracy when it is truly democracy? And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find the stories that you saw tonight, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please be sure to join us every week right here on New England Public Media for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saivalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and have a great evening. Support for Connecting Points is provided by our contributing viewers. fathers in the tragedy of 9-11. Why did he have to go to work that specific day? They came of age in a time of social unrest. It definitely took a toll.